One of the biggest things that I mourn is that I didn't get to grow up in the culture. If we really want to go back to the root of the problem, blame Russia, blame colonization. We were completely severed from our homeland. If you have a problem of me being other ancestries, if that never happened, then I could be 100% Circassian. Like we would have never, my family would have never left the homeland. So what was your first reaction when you learned that part of your history? Um... Hi, welcome to Refugee from Russia podcast. I hope you're doing well. I traveled across the United States to meet with people who immigrated to America from Russia to hear their stories. Now, this wasn't an easy task and my team faced a lot of challenges. I do hope that you enjoy this new series because we really worked very hard on this. Sit back, relax and enjoy. By the way, before I go, if you want to share your story with me, you're from Russia, from XUSSR, leave me a comment or send me a message via my Gmail. It's Refugee from Russia podcast at gmail.com. Hey, Zan. Welcome. Welcome to my podcast. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you? Mm, I'm very good. When I was coming here, I had this thought in my head. Do you realize that we are both the original Caucasians. <laughs> For yes. anyone who doesn't know what the hell I just said. <laughs> Can no. you explain that? So like the me from like 2014 when I discovered my Circassian ancestry would like be like so confused. Like looking back at this moment and being like, wait, what am I talking about? Being like, yeah, we're like the real Caucasians. And like even I even still feel weird like saying that in the sense because it has such a connotation um, that people don't understand and an incorrect connotation. And a lot of people that I've seen online that I've tried to engage with on certain posts and posts that are getting attention that I will chime in on and be like, oh, I'm part Circassian and blah, blah, blah. Um, there's a lot of pushback sometimes. And I just try to stay as informational as possible. But the truth is that we are Euro-Asian peoples in the Eurasian crossroads. And it's really a stolen word that comes from this pseudoscience from Johann Blumenbach that got so twisted that the U.S. started to use it and twist it even further to mean just white-skinned people from Europe. And they did so in order to um, continue to discriminate against um, people of color. And I believe it was an Indian man was the main um, court case um, to deny them rights. And so it's just wild that there's this word that means one thing where we come from and I know as you know as well that like the context of it within Russian society it doesn't it means like the opposite of how it's used in the U.S. It means actually someone who is darker. Yeah. 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 So in the Caucasus we are an incredibly diverse range of people yeah. that includes so many things including skin color and even the lighter skinned white skinned light skinned whatever um Kafkazis, Circassians, Dagestanis, English, whatever, um, still get called Turkey, I yeah. believe is the word, yeah, right? Yeah. So for anyone who doesn't know this 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 um, cultural context, so in Russia, there is two types of people, the Russians and non-Russians. It's kind of hard to explain that for anyone who is a Westerner because it doesn't make a lot of sense, but it does make a lot of cultural sense in Russia. People who are Russian are ethnically Russians, for instance, like... And our average Katya or Masha that you think of when you think Russian girl. And people who are non-Russian are people like Khabib, uh, Chimaev, the famous fighters, UFC fighters. So if you are non-Russian, you have pretty much a lower standing in the society. And what you said, Churka, is a very common slur used against people who are not ethnically Russian, mm. a.k.a. Caucasian. Mm -hmm. Now, not in the sense of white, the way you use it in America, but in the sense of people from the Caucasia or from the Caucasus. So when we talk about Caucasians or Circassians or Dagestani or Chechens, I, am, I take this for granted because mm. I knew who I am my whole life, mm. right? I never, maybe until after coming to America, I never had a question of who I am as far as my identity. Mm -hmm. But it's not the case for a lot of people, is it? Yeah, I mean, especially in the U.S. and I, you know, with my story, how it's 
I guess you could say unique in the sense of like having these unknown ancestries that I discovered um, and multiple, multiple things that just co- got covered up by just being, you know, Russian, quote unquote. Um, so up until 2014, is it correct to say you considered yourself Russian? Uh, yes. Yeah. Oh. Um. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. <laughs> it's the way it was like, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, but no, like going diving deeper into that, if you want me to kind of, I would love that. that, Yeah. Um, so, um, up till 2014, right. The narrative from my dad's side of the family was that he was full Russian. Um, and so, you know, I had this identity that was half Russian and, you know, nothing else really to question, except that my dad had no answers as to where in Russia we were from. Mm -hmm. So that's when I started doing my own research and, um, from an ancestor name that he had. So my great, great grandfather, Konstantin Hagendokov, uh, by searching that name, I was able to find a website that was made by a distant relative uh, who lives in France, um, who made a website about him um, and his Circassian ancestry. Um, So he was a general in the Russian army. And because of his uh, military standing, there was a lot is a lot more information on him and our and our family, which um, is something that uh, that I'm very fortunate to have, and that a lot of people don't have. Like for Circassians, like some of my really good friends, like um, who are originally from Jordan, um, they'll know their grandparents, maybe great grandparents, and after that, nothing. Yeah, no, that fascinates yeah. me so much. Yeah, an Arab or a North African, wherever they are geographically, maybe they relocated. But anyone who is of Middle Eastern descent is also Circassian. Mm. Blew my mind when I learned about that. Yeah. Yeah, no, I didn't know about that for a while. Um, actually, I think the first time, sounds kind of funny, that I found out about that was that, do you know the singer, um, I think it's Had- Hadissa or Hadisha? She's from Turkey. Um, I'm not familiar. She, was, she sang for Turkey in Eurovision, um, but people were calling her Circassian. So I researched that because I oh. I love Eurovision and just like knowing that she was. I was like, oh, my God, the singer who was on this world stage, who's Circassian. I'm so glad you know about it because most I, Americans don't know what Eurovision is. Yeah. Oh, my God. I love Eurovision so much. Me too. Um, I have a, like a, a fantasy of like uh, a Circassian artist being able to like sing, but like in, like as part of Georgia oh, or something like just that. Just like um, I forgot her name, but there was an artist, a Crimean Tatar artist representing Jamala. Ukraine. Yes. Yes. Who won? Yes. Yeah. That was an incredible moment to witness. Yeah. We will go back to that a little <laughs> bit because I would love to talk more about your career as mm. a singer, as a songwriter, yeah, and singer. Yeah. But going back to what you said, you started to look into who Circassians are through music. Um, not exactly. Um, but the point that I was making with with the singer from Turkey. Um, once I researched her more, I found out that she's um. Uh, she's Kumik and I want to say Les. Lesgin? Oh, then she's Dagestani. Yeah, she's from Dagestani, Dagestan. basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's when I... Basically, there's just so many things that took years and years for me to learn to, like, come to where I am now. Not that I'm an expert or anything like that. But, like, all these... Like, that was a little piece. That was a little piece of the puzzle. That was like, oh, anybody from the Caucasus or kind of surrounding areas were called Circassian at one point. Wow. Um... So it started with you learning more about your dad's side. Yeah. And then yeah, yeah, yeah. brought you to exploring the or finding the different ethnicities of Dagestan. Yeah. What was the next step? So uh, when I found this website and found out, you know, this distant relative talking about my great great grandfather being part Circassian, um, you know, that's when I was like, Circassian, so what, what's that? And looked it up and that started, God, I think it all in, I, I kind of consider it a six year journey from 2014 to 2020 was the period of time where I was relearning, reconnecting, rediscovering Circassian history, our culture, our language, what it means to be Circassian. Um, and just slowly over time, collecting as much information as possible, like spending hours and hours every night, like on Wikipedia, on different websites and different books, just learning everything I could. Because uh, not that this is the only reason why, but one of the huge driving force was discovering the Circassian genocide. And 
just, um, you know, having this set identity of myself and having it just completely shattered yeah. um, to finding out that I come from an ancestry as well that's gone through something um, terrible. It's arguably the first genocide in modern history. Yeah. I've even read before from um, my friend, I, I, as you know her, um, Noor from um, actually Caucasian, mm. um, that the term ethnic cleansing actually came from came from that. That's when it was coined. Yeah, and for anyone who doesn't know, the Caucasian genocide was a part of the Caucasian war or the war in the Caucasus that was waged by the Russian army. A fun fact, because I speak Russian, mm. I was looking up some of the information about the Caucasian war in Russian. Mm -hmm. And the term that is used very often is not colonization. It's not conquest. It's a different word. Mm -hmm. Now, the word is присоединение. When I tried to translate that word into English, I was puzzled by what I found. So let me read you in the Russian books how is Caucasian war in general is described. Oh, it's described as... This is the word I translated, присоединение. The translation is either connection, attachment, joining, accession. Mm. None of those words sound terrible to me. I'm not surprised. So, but let's just highlight some of the facts. Mm. Almost 90% of the Circassian population during the Caucasian War were killed either directly through the war or because of the exile, or because of the harsh conditions of deportation. Yeah. So what was your first reaction when you learned that part of your history? Um, I think I was numb for a little bit, honestly. I think mentally, physically, whatever, everything, I was trying to just process that information because that's one of the first things like oh circassians let me google that circassian genocide let me click on that so it was very fast that like that all came together um and so reading that and just reading through like the wikipedia page for example of like the facts and just being like what i i i don't know what to do with this information um i think i think it was an awakening um and it was like the, it was like the breath of the ancestors finally, like almost like a sigh of relief from them, like being like, we've been hurt finally. Um, I'm getting goosebumps. I, <laughs> it, and it makes me emotional thinking, thinking about it in general, but really thinking about that moment of, because for, for myself, who I am, I'm very connection to my ancestral roots is very important. Um, and something that I had tracked for, for even before 2014. Um, and this idea of connection to homeland is very important to me. So additionally, finding out about this homeland, it's, um, it's just hard to wrap your, it was hard to wrap my brain around. Still is. I am curious though about your identity as an mm. American. So you are essentially an American Circassian. Yeah. How do you, when you think about like communities, culture, or even maybe code switching on some level, mm. like how do you feel as an American Circassian living in America who's never been to their homeland? Um, I think I feel like an outsider or on the periphery of a lot of different communities that I'm technically a part of but not necessarily feel included in or that I want to be in. Mm. Like when we talk about like American culture, that's not really anything I, I really care about. That's one of the things that makes it very hard to get non-Caucasian, non-Turkish mm. students when I teach Caucasian dance. Is mm. that it's like American culture is here, 
And then Caucasian culture is on the opposite polar direction. Yeah. And even just to me, that is a bit of shock when I was trying to introduce the dance because how, first of all, if you introduce a dance, you have a name for it. For example, bachata, right? You have a name for it. Mm. Our dances as a, an umbrella term would be Caucasian dances. Mm -hmm. But all people think about is two-step. <laughs> yeah. So I, 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 I feel you. The struggle is real. Mm -hmm. Um, but someone, as someone who's been living here for a long time, and I'm sure you're more attuned to the culture, in your perspective, how would you, what's the right way to introduce Caucasian culture? I, I, and I just use the umbrella term, right? Yeah. I think Armenian culture is more so, is known here, although yeah. it's very different from the Armenian culture that I've seen in Russia. Mm. Very different. Really? So, Arme for instance, since I'm talking about Armenians, Armenians in Russia would more identify with me and connect with me than Armenians in California. Yeah. So uh. going back to my question, how would you, as someone who's lived there for a long time and you've seen cultures mm -hmm. uh, emerge and, and, and change and adapt and become part of the mainstream, how do we do this? Like, how do we make our just like ancestry and culture be known? Starting with the dance, because I mean, mm. <clears throat> it's hard. Yeah. Um, I think the dance is, is one of the first things that people think of who have some idea of the Caucasus. Um, I think that's cultural representation or a visual representation. I feel like in Circassian culture, that's a, dance is a really big thing. So I think that's something that um, people are more so drawn to. Um, like there's a group of in, so in New Jersey is the biggest Circassian community in the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of Kavkazi people there, actually. I know there's um, uh, Kedachai and Balkar, mm -hmm. a big community there as well. Um, but they sometimes will go to Times Square in New York and I have, think a, have seen, a jag. <laughs> I think much. one of the videos, yeah. Yeah, and they have sometimes have really like blown up and been shared like across like social media. Um, so I think that could be one of those things. Um, I think in general, and it's kind of a general term, but just more education around that. And honestly, maybe one of the first things is that to have some type of, I don't know if movement's the right word, but some type of more awareness of being like, stop calling yourself Caucasian. You're not Caucasian. Mm. Um, if you're if you're white, Italian. Yeah, yeah. Stuff like that. Where, And, you know, I I hear it as an American, like I hear it used really often and, you know, something I see online or sometimes in person too. And it makes my blood boil because it's an incorrect. You have already one word. Why do you need two? You, yeah. Yeah. Well, because the thing is, it's like you actually have not gone through these hardships, genocide, ethnic cleansing, exile, annexation, colonization. You have not gone through those things. Of course, deportation, one of the hardest things that all Caucasian people had to go through. Yes. Yeah. Um, literally from the Black Sea to the Caspian Sea, literally yeah. all of us. Um, so that's like it's one of the weirdest things to be like that. It, it's it's just such the opposite thing of what they're calling themselves. And I've never really had any opportunities. Like I've even heard it from coworkers at work, like referencing something that they did as like Caucasian or something. And I'm like, mm, mm. Mm, no, 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 no. Um, and some of them, it's interesting. One, I do have a really good friend there who has used that term, but she also knows a, more of my story and like the background and you know, has even seen my posts on social media and like on my story and stuff like that. So it's interesting that she'll, she knows that, but she'll still use it in that way. And like sometimes has preferenced or afterward has been like, oh, but I know that like, you're like the real Caucasian. Mm. And I'm like, I don't, I don't know what to say here. I'm, I'm, I don't know what, this is a lot. Yeah. I think right now what I'm hearing is there are multiple options. We are mm. either dancing at Times Square. Yeah. We become viral. <laughs> yeah. Or there is some massive effort to educate people. Yeah. Well, and that's the thing. I, I see a lot, and I've heard this reflected in some of my peers as well, my Caucasian peers mm -hmm. still feels really weird to even just say it like that. 
Um, but um, I see it reflected a lot about that we ourselves as a community don't do enough. Like, yes, we can dance, but if we're just dancing and not interacting or um, networking, working with other communities, then we're never going to get anywhere. We're going to be just stuck as, oh, there's, there's those people dancing over there. We don't know exactly what's going on with them. Um, and I think if it's not coming from us, it's not going to happen in the U.S. Like, the U.S. as an entity, governmentally, it's not going to come from them. I'm going to say something controversial, and probably people from my community are going to hate me for this, but truth hurts sometimes. Most of Caucasians who live in America are not educated. Mm. Very few speak English. And even fewer of them have positions of power or educated enough to a point where they can start writing uh, books or write um, PhD uh, work mm -hmm. to spread the information among the academia. I say this to say that I have an example of a Central Asian community that's also not known. For instance, a lot of folks, when they think about um, Central Asians, they just say, oh, just, just, just part of the Asia. But made a few people realize there is implication on things like scholarships, mm. how they are identified as a nonprofit organization. If they, I was a part of a, an event, a Ramadan event in mm -hmm. New York, very shortly, I'll share. And this girl uh, had the mic and she said that I wrote a PhD paper on why Central Asians are different. You know, someone who is Turkmen or Kazakh is not the same as South, uh, South Korean. Huge political and cultural and economical um, discrepancies there. Mm -hmm. And therefore, when they recognize the way they are, there is an enormous amount of not just personal satisfaction, but recognition in this country. Yeah. So unfortunately, when I, when I am around Caucasians, most of them don't speak English. Mm -hmm. A, B, are not interested in what they take for granted, which is spreading mm -hmm. their culture and community because that's not a question. Mm -hmm. However, their kids, they are the ones going to start having a hard time because they're, they're now being brought up in this country. They will speak English and they will be asking questions like you have, you know, as a younger self before 2014 and after yeah. you went through this, um, I would say, uh, somewhat crisis of who you are. Yeah, yeah. So... I, so you, you, I learned a little bit about what the journey has been for you. Um, but has there been anything that you wish you did not know about your community that you now know? Any um, disappointed that has come from learning that this is how things are right now in my community? Anything that you wish were different? Definitely a lot that I wish was different. In regards to wishing I didn't know, um, I don't wish that because then I'd be ignorant or be choosing to be ignorant. Um, and I want to know the truth about all of it. And there's been a lot of disappointing things seeing the way that we're treated in Russian society as, you know, second class, lower than them, as animals, as sa savages, you know, it's common usage. Um, there's a lot of things. How do I get into this? So, um, take your time. So yeah. So um, technically, like my percentage, right, isn't very high of being Circassian. I even hate saying it that way, but like that is a scientific fact. We could say it as that, but because of that fact, um. A lot of people, Circassians, different communities have not wanted to include me um, because I'm not enough. And, you know, either genetically or culturally. And like, yeah, that sucks. Like, obviously, genetically, that's not anything I have control over. Um, and I think one of the biggest things that I mourn is that I didn't get to grow up in the culture. 
like it's been absolutely beautiful to um, to to come from the different a different direction to like learn about it one thing at a time and to slowly immerse myself in it and kind of be like outside looking in and joining that um and it's also been I won't sugarcoat it. Honestly, the hardest things I've ever had to deal with with the feeling of rejection and not wanting to be included, which, you know, some of that I understand in the sense of like wanting protect, to protect something so sacred. But just because people like me exist doesn't mean that we are a threat to the longevity of the communities that we do belong to and we are also not trying to infiltrate them to take them down um and i think where that stems from from that response of people not wanting to include someone like myself um comes from the fear of of us disappearing um of being getting so diluted that we just lose who we are um, and so unfortunately, a lot of that s- gets, um, caught up in like a, like a, um, like a racial purity type of thing, which a- again, to an extent I understand, um, but like communities like Georgians, like Armenians, like, yes, staying within the community is a very big thing, but, um, from my experience, I haven't seen it as such an intense thing in Circassian community. And Georgians and Armenians have a homeland where that's not an actual worry that Georgians are going to disappear. That so it's Armenians not a matter of survival. Disappear. Yeah, it's not exactly a matter of survival. For us, it is because we've been severed from that homeland and we are a diasporic nation. So you will only marry a Circassian woman, right? I don't know. <laughs> That doesn't, that's the thing. It doesn't matter to me. Um, the, I, I would understand friends and, you know, people who do want to marry within the community. Um, and for, for myself, like, that's not as important. Um, what about the language? Ooh, what about it? <laughs> How important it is for you to know the language and what has been your journey so far mm. with the language itself? Um, one other thing I want to say on what I was talking about to kind of finish that thought was that, um, what was I going to say? Um, so we have a lot of people are acting in a way of survival, right? Because we've been cut off from that homeland and it's really unfortunate that I've been attacked literally, not physically, but like online, stuff like that, receiving hate mail and death threats and stuff like that. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a lot, honestly. Um, and it's confusing. It's very confusing. The idea that I'm considered like too different or not enough type of thing to be included. Right. But, um, I always, in my head, it's like, well, what's the root of this problem? Like, you know, obviously I'm many different ancestries, so it's not like, you know, just the Circassian or something. But like, if we really want to go back to the root of the problem, blame Russia, blame colonization. We were completely severed from our homeland. If you have a problem of me being other ancestries, if that never happened, then I could be 100% Circassian. Like we would have never, my family would have never left the homeland. You know, stuff like that, where I think often the community is not, going far enough back to the actual root problems that were created for us in the 1700s and 1800s that has led to the ways that we are desperately clinging to survival today. You know what's interesting? Because I have a different perspective. Mm. I grew up in Russia. Mm -hmm. So occasions in Russia are a bit chill about this. Really? So obviously there is a stronger community in the... Uh, more closed environments um, in the Caucasus itself. Mm. But if you come across a Circassian living somewhere outside of the Caucasus, Mm. fun fact, they say, oh, I'm going, if they go to Moscow, I'm going to Russia. 
they come back to the Caucasus. I came I came from Russia. If somebody asks you, yeah. they have this, this distinction in their head geographically. Yeah. yeah. But as Caucasian living in, say, Pskov, might in where? Sorry. Pskov, one of the Russian cities. Oh, okay. Um, any take any Russian city. They are more um, loosened up on the perspective of okay, should I marry only Circassian woman? Should I be only with Circassian community? Because I think for them, because yes, ninety percent of the population has been killed, but they're still the majority in their communities, right? Mm -hmm. So they are not worrying about the survival again. Mm -hmm. So what's interesting, right? When they're surrounded by their people. And I've experienced this myself. Mm. You, you distance yourself. Mm. Growing up, I distanced myself from my community because I thought too much drama, too much gossip. Um, I feel a bit overwhelmed. So same for Circassians, same for Armenians, same for any Caucasian person. When they are surrounded by the majority of their own people, they have a different mindset. They might be the ones that are strictly Circassian from the perspective perspective of their code of conduct mm. and there might be people who are like okay I like my culture but I want to marry a Russian woman mm. so it sounds like it's a, uh, a complete other uh, story here in America because of how survival takes a precedence in in their communities yeah. they are very very strict interesting yeah, yeah. interestingly the next generation of Circassians in America will be a bit different so I would even go as far as to say the issues that you're experiencing now is what the generation to come will start experiencing. Yeah. Because they will be grappling with their dual identity. Yeah. So it's almost like you're ahead of the time and the kids that will be coming up in the next in the next generations, two or three, they will start saying, I don't feel accepted by my community. Mm. And I am pure Circassian. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and even... I guess, you know, just to talk about the real issues going on, like, um, I don't know if you know about the CBA in New Jersey. It's the Circassian Benevolent Association. It's, um, you know, the biggest, like, um, community um, building organization, in, you know, in the U.S. for Circassians. Um, they, uh, maybe about a year ago, maybe a little bit more now, they decided to revoke... Um, membership for anyone who wasn't full Circassian. Um, mm -hmm. But there's a caveat to that. They still consider um, if your father is Circassian, but your mother's not, they still consider you a full Circassian and will let you participate. How do they check? I don't know. I have no idea. Um, it was a very big, very big thing for Circassians in the U.S. for that to happen. I, th I think all around the U.S. It was all something being talked about. And um, I think it's a very poignant and perfect, perfect example of the infighting or the fighting within our own community that we're doing that's doing a, um, a grave disservice to us as a whole. Um, well, thanks, Russia. Yes. Yeah. No, uh, well, and something that Russia loves to do is to pit us against each other, um, you know, to come in even literally geographically, like, you know, in the Caucasus, create problems and then leave. And then we're the ones they're left trying to figure it out and then at war with each other. Um, but but yeah, you know, even Circassia isn't one of the um, um, the, the republics because they don't they want us to be divided. Um, that's why, like, you know, you have Ingushetia and Chechnya, Dagestan, but Circassia is not there. It's divided between four different, um, yeah, republics. But anyways, yeah. Um, I learned that, by the way, actually, uh, before, um, before you continue. That part, the geographical dispersion, I learned that after I moved to the mm. States. Because um, my personal experience growing up in Russia I never had this, I guess, connection, mental um, map in my head where I understood that Circassians are a huge ethnic group um, within the Caucasus. I, I always thought of them as a bit separate. I thought, for example, Karachay or Cherkessia. Mm. I thought they were Karachay, and they're Cherkess. I thought the Kabardin and Balkaria, the Kabardin people, and there's the um, Balkar people. And it wasn't part of my 
history upbringing as well. I have never learned mm. the part where, I mean, going back to what you said, it's not even called a uh, 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 conquest. It's not called colonization. It's called yeah. joining. Yeah. So we joined Russia. Yeah. Uh, as 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 Caucasian people, as Caucasian, as Chechens mm-hmm. and Dagestanis. So. Well, and that's something Russia does a lot too, like with the English and Chechen, well, and other people in the Caucasus and you know Crimean Tatars as well with the deportations. Yes, there were deportations, but they wanted the word deportation to be connected to that and not genocide. They were genocides. I never thought about it that way. Yeah, that's something that I've seen Chechen community talk about a lot. But they were genocides of all these communities. But it was really in the history books painted as just deportations. And oh, look, they got to return later and stuff like that. But after how many had been killed, um, either before being deported, deported, during the process and trying to come back, there were genocides. So, do you remember the first time you heard your traditional music? Traditional Circassian music? Um, what was your reaction? I don't specifically, but it was definitely part of my journey of reconnecting. Um, I... Uh, so Because I, I imagine as, it's like super different. <laughs> From to anyone you, who is in America. Well, okay. The, one of the first things that I did notice or think about, so I knew who Kozaks were, right? I know that. And I think that, well, in America, that's generally something known about. Like, oh, the Russians and the Kozaks are like kind of these Russians that dress a certain way, right? So I knew that. And so I was like, okay, the music and the dancing kind of looks like this and the outfits they're wearing. Yeah, because they they took it from the Caucasus. Because it was stolen. Yeah. yeah. So like now knowing a lot more and, you know, as I learned more, it really dawned on me. I was like, wow, the Kozaks is it's just a complete theft of Caucasian culture. Settlers in that and, way. Yes, exactly. Um, it's a cultural appropriation and it's like a, like a bastardized version of it in the sense that there's actually no cultural oh, context. Oh, I never thought about it that way. Yeah. It's like a, whoa, yeah, it's there's, a watered down version. of Yes. There's no cultural context in what they're doing. So that's why it's so, it's so different because they don't understand, you know, the certain dance moves mean this and this dance is connecting to this type of thing. And so they're just, they're like leaping and twirling and squatting and stuff like that. And so like as a person who's reclaimed their circadian identity sees this, it's it, it's so insulting. Yeah. It, it's, and, and especially that that is what the world, when they think, um, well, not when they think Caucasian, but when they think about like, oh, Russia, and we're talking about these people. Oh, okay, the Kozaks, we know who, who you are now. Like that's what the world sees as Caucasian culture, even though they don't know that it's Caucasian or whatever. But that's not even us. It's just it's. And if you you know probably the history of of Kozaks, if for anyone who doesn't know, just uh, want to share a fun fact or not so fun. Mm. Uh, Kozaks were former um, uh, serfs who were part of the serfdom in Russia, and they ran away in the pursuit of freedom in the Caucasus because they knew once they enter the mountainous area of the Caucasus, they are not going to be given back into the uh, Russian forces. Once they settled, obviously they didn't have any money, any food, they just left with whatever they had. They started to adapt not only the culture, but also started to get very comfortable in the Caucasus to a point where the indigenous people of the Caucasus would give them their their own clothes Mm. and even sometimes let them live in their houses. So the hospitality of the culture. Exactly. I mean, it's it's a huge part of the culture. Yeah. Essentially, after they have given them the warm place to stay, food to eat and clothes to wear. Now the Russian army bribed them by offering bigger privileges in exchange for rotting them out. The folks, the people that protected them Mm -hmm. in the first place. So that's how in the, in the modern history or how we all know now as people who are from Russia directly, Kozaks are the people who serve for the government or help the government to keep peace. Mm. That's how I knew of them. 
mm-hmm. before I actually started looking into mm-hmm. it. Yeah. And yeah. we have Cossacks in different parts of, of the country yeah. still till today and enjoying the privileges that the ancestors sold their souls for. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, just to be betrayed and backstabbed like that from people that we um, tried to help as well. And we've done that for many peoples. Um, I don't know if you're aware of, like, we um, hid Jewish people. When oh, the, I didn't know that. Yeah. When the um, when the Nazis were in the Caucasus, um, they even put the swastika flag in Mount Elbrus. Um, when they were in there, we hid um, Jews in our communities and, um, you know, just passed them off as just as one of us. Um, do you know of the, the Afro-Abkhazian um, mm-hmm. population as well? No. Um, there's a Afro-Abkhazian uh, population. We don't know exactly how they got there, um, but it's thought that some type of slave ship crashed in the Black Sea. So perhaps something connected to like Ottoman slave trade um, and um, crashed there on the shores. And, um, and we took them in. And I don't it's something I would really love to know today what happened to their population mm. and where they are now. But you can see pictures from very far back of uh, black people in the Caucasus dressed in, you know, the traditional oh, wear. I've, and, never, I've never known about yeah, that. Yeah. Yeah. And they spoke the language. They were part of they were part of the community. They weren't enslaved. They weren't treated differently. We, we took them in. That's a part of the Caucasus that I absolutely love because yeah. it's diverse as far as religious backgrounds. I mean, there are Armenians, there are Azerbaijanis who are Shia Muslim, Mm -hmm. and there is the north of the Caucasus that's predominantly Sunni. Yeah. In Russia itself, I I, I will speak from my experience, if you are of the Caucasus descent, you are more connected to your fellow Caucasian Christian Armenian person than you are connected, or, or, or then, I'm sorry, let me just take that back. The Armenian Christian man or woman will be more connected to me, a Muslim Caucasian woman, than they would be to a Russian Christian woman. Mm-hmm. Why? Because we share the mountain, the mountains, and we also share a deep culture. Yeah. So there is a lot of connection there. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask you about your inspiration for becoming a songwriter and a singer, mm-hmm. and how did learning about your ancestry impacted uh, mm-hmm. your career in general? Yeah. So, um, God, for a while, I've been really um, wanting to pursue music and my music as a singer-songwriter. Um, I think since 2010 is when, well, I was, I was writing songs before that, but 2010 is when I really got more serious about it, is when I started university and um, started as a business major and was like, no, this is not, <laughs> I can't do this. This is not me. Um, and I did, I did stick it out and I got a degree in anthropology, which makes sense, a lot of sense for who I am now. And I'm really glad I, I did get that degree. Um, like if I were to apply that towards something, I would picture myself, you know, doing some type of studies that would help my community um, oh, in, in some way. And amazing. there are some colleges now across the, in the world that um, have Caucasus studies as like a, a branch or like a focus. I think there's one in Sweden um, that I wow, know Wow, I've never heard of that. Yeah. Um, and it's kind of, I, I think one of them kind of lumps it, not lumped together, but it's, kind of, it's like Caucasus in Central Asia. Um, but, um, but yeah, so I uh, have been writing songs for a very long time and haven't really tried taking like more of like a step into it yet. I was kind of doing it more so and then leading up to 2020 kind of brought things back. But um, um, learning of my full background has definitely informed how I write and what I write today. Um, Have you written in in your native language, in in circassian? I have, not fluently. I have not been studious as of late, but I have um, been learning the language in uh, 2020. So from 2014, right, to 2020, that's when I was reclaiming it all. And in 2020, it was like, okay, like, I don't have to be stuck in the space of just like, of course, I'm always learning, right? Yeah. But like, this is who I am now. 
And that's when I started to go by a Circassian name. Um, I made that choice because of who we are, where we come from, and what happened to us. It felt and important. And the name is everything. Yeah, exactly. That's what you lead with. And that, yeah. and, you know, since working again, you know, in 2020, there was kind of that break. Since working again, it, it really actually does, I'm actually just realizing it now, it really does prove a difference because so many people at, at work who I'm helping have asked about it and I've described it. And now that's, I don't know, like probably like over a hundred people I've told that little blurb to. And now like all these people know that, you know, there's this little seed that Circassians exist. Yeah. Um, and that they're not Russian. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I think it, that is one of the reasons why it, it, it is important. Um, it's a, a name that I formulated myself from the language. Um, so I think it was 2020 is when I wanted to do that. And 2021, like literally January 1st is when I decided to, you know, change my social media and yeah. stuff like that. And I think eventually I do legally want to change it. Um, and, and going by my Circassian last name as well, Hagendoko or Hagendokwa. Um, when will you be ready with the Circassian song? I, I would don't know. love to hear it. Um, so, ready. yeah, yeah. So uh, 2020, um, and I think really this was like the first one of its kind and first time this was really happening, but language courses were being offered online, um, you know, through Zoom and stuff like that. And that had never really happened before. Uh, I believe so. I believe that's what I was told. Language. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah, yeah. amazing. So I took a class with Professor um, Nazar Hamid. Um, he's um, Cir you know, Circassian from Sounds Turkey. Middle Oh, okay. I thought that was a uh, Jordanian Circassian. Mm. Um, so I took class with him and then um, a class with John Tia if you know of him. Um, he has his own language app called Optolingo that Circassian is included, which actually that's when I first started learning. So 2019 is when I started learning because the that's app nice. came out and it was, so that was really the first time like, yeah, I'd been hearing like the songs and the music and kind of starting to formulate and understand like, oh, okay, that's Circassian right there. Like I can recognize that. Um, so then with John, John T's app is really when I started to learn the language for the first time. And it's like, it felt kind of like a kid in a candy store and just being like, oh, hello. Like, let me press this and hear how we say hello. Just all these words. Um, and it was just really cool. Um, to, to start that introduction. Um, and it's something that I believe it was um, Professor Hamid said was that um, language is the heart of a culture. Um, something along those lines. Do you feel that if you become fluent in the language that the community will accept you? Potentially if they didn't actually know who I was, like if they just saw me and I was speaking fluently, perhaps, but I feel like if they actually like knew me and my story, which I don't know how, from what it seems in the, in some of the U S community, like I'm kind of known of because of my story. And because of that, some people distance themselves from me. Like <laughs> it feels so weird, like talking about this, like, you know, I'm something that's going to be more like really public, but like I've been blocked from certain Instagram accounts just because like people. Will, so occasion accounts. Yes. Yeah. People will like, you know, like history accounts, stuff like that. People will send me something. I'm like, oh, it says like um, it, it, I can't view it. Why do you think they do that? Because um, they don't believe I'm circassian. I think they're trying to protect. Um, they see me as like a, a fake. And so they're trying to protect it. And there are fakes out there. There really are. I forget her name, but there's this kind of famous Russian um, social media person who um, I thought was Circassian. I, I knew of her, um, but she's actually a fake. She pretends to be Circassian. Apparently her boyfriend like would pretend to be Chechen or something like that. Um, I don't know too too much of that story so I can't say exactly what is fact and what is not but that is something I've heard and I've seen it in Russian society in general especially in Siberia a, a appropriation mm -hmm. of like the dress and being and you know people who yeah. Russians born in Siberia being like oh I'm Siberian it's like no you're you're not you're Russian like there's a difference you know there's a difference and 
you're trying to perpetuate some type of narrative that you're different and cool or something like that from by doing so. You know, when I when I'm listening to you, um, again, going back to the fact that I lived in Russia my almost my whole life, I've met a lot of minorities. I don't know if I met Circassians a lot. I think I only met one person who was my sister's friend. She mm. was Circassian. But I met a lot of Caucasians in general, like Armenians, Azerbaijanis, Chechen, mm-hmm. etc. There were a lot of them that identified as, well, not even, they don't use the word identified. Ethnically, they were just one thing, but they didn't speak the language. Mm. What's interesting is they are also not accepted in their community as fully Chechen yeah. or fully uh, Azerbaijani or mm-hmm. fully, you know, fill in the blanks even though they are both, you know, come from a s- parents that are of the same ethnicity, but they don't speak the language. So that's kind of fascinating that the level, the idea of accept- acceptance or the concept of, of acceptance is so different. Yeah. When you are in America versus when you're living back in Russia. I have heard that as well, that mm. the language is a really big part of that. It's it's dying. I mean, there's so many yeah. Caucasians in Russia that don't speak their language. Yeah. And it's not even a, a dramatic exaggeration. It's the reality that we're living in. Yeah. The, especially the younger generation, they don't speak their ethnic language. Yeah. And so in that case, are they still considered a part of the community? Are they still mm. ethnically, again, fill in the blank, yeah. Chechen, Angush, etc.? I don't know. I feel like that is something I would love to talk to someone who you know, has an opposing view to you and, yeah. and see what they have to say. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I have um, friends, you know, full-blooded Circassian, but because they don't speak the language, they've even been called like, oh, you're not Circassian. Like they've literally been told that before. And so it is really mind blowing just to be like, well, again, you know, let's go back to the root of the problem. Why, why don't I speak Circassian? Why doesn't this person speak Circassian, speak Adigabza, you know, as we call the language? Um, we weren't allowed to speak the language. Um, in the different places that we ended up, you know, namely Turkey, um, that's something I know more of the policies I can speak to, but in Russian as well, or Russia, in Russia and in Turkey, we were not allowed to speak the language because we they wanted us to be fully assimilated and dissolved. Um, and if we did, we were punished. Um, There's a phrase, sorry, I interrupt. Gavarin no normalnym. Mm. In English, the literal, the the yeah, the literal translation would be, speak on a normal, speak the normal language. Mm. Mm-hmm. It's something that you would hear. Yeah, I heard it growing up when I spoke my native language. Mm-hmm. So on top of what you described, you also get these comments from people. Yeah, 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 and so that's why there are such these huge generational gaps of people who don't speak the language, and so when people try to um approach it now it's really hard yeah like there's before these online classes or jaunty's language app there's nothing there were some websites that kind of had some dictionaries but like it's not very um you, there's not a lot there so that's why for the longest time i was like i want to learn the language but i don't know how to there's there's no way to unless you were connected to the community or had someone who could teach you personally or in person um, and so again, going back to the root of the problem, like, I'm sorry, I don't speak Circassian. Like that was stolen from me because of colonization. And then I, sometimes I get, um, upset that I meet someone who is from the North, Northern Caucasus. They don't speak their language, but they are excellent at Russian. Mm, yeah. Well, and even in the Russian school systems, um, uh, the indigenous languages aren't taught. And they're they're like an elective type of thing. Like you could choose to do them, but it's not something really um, given any focus to whatsoever. And I don't remember her name, but in one of our classes with uh, Professor Nazar Hamid, um, there was a woman who was a linguistic teacher um, from the Coxes, like lived in, mm-hmm. I think she lived in Nalchik. Um, and... Um, we, we were asking her questions and I asked her a question that was like, how is it trying to teach our language within the parameters of the Russian education system and how much they try to block it? Mm-hmm. And she kind of like, she was like, 
like she kind of well, she kind of almost like chuckled too at the, the kind of this thing of like, God, yeah, it's it's impossible. And mm-hmm. so, you know, once pro- our professor translated it, it was that something um, she said something along the lines of like, it's just something that we've just had to learn to deal with and that we know there are going to be these obstacles trying to stop us. And so, you know, they don't they don't want it. They're trying to block it. Yeah. I have a a couple of things that I wanted to ask you. So this doesn't require a lot of thinking. Okay. Um, finished sentence. I wish I. I wish I. Uh, well, honestly, honestly, the first thing that came to mind was I wish I was, quote unquote, more Circassian. Sometimes. I'm sorry. I don't know if you want me to go Please into Please do more. and continue. <laughs> but, you know, I, I can't lie that sometimes I wish I was more genetically Circassian or whatever. And maybe there's a part of me in there that like, yeah, I really, really associate with this part of myself. But I don't um, I don't think of anything else as a part of my background as less. Um, I will say, and if you do want to talk about it too, it is very interesting holding being both Circassian and Russian. Mm. Um, but yeah, no, there are some things that I'm just like, yeah, I kind of, I kind of do wish that I was more. And maybe that also comes from a place of wanting to be accepted. Um, but yeah. It's interesting that I. It's interesting that. Say it one more time. We can skip that one. Okay. Okay. I regret that I. I regret that I was too quick in certain things, thinking that I knew something, but I really hadn't yet. Like in regards to approaching Circassian community or thinking that I would be accepted. I think that I would do it very differently now. I learned that I... I learned that... I'm resilient through this process. It's been hard and beautiful, but... The hard part is not being accepted fully? That's Yeah, that's definitely a big part of it. Um, I think I'd mentioned that it has been some of the hardest things I've had to deal with in my life of certain things, whether emotionally processing all of this and learning everything, but also the other things I've mentioned as well. Literally, the the hardest things I've ever had to deal with. If only I... If only I... It only really comes back if only I could go back. If only I could go back to do it again. I mean, let's use, you know, it's a lot of things that people, I think, say to the idea of like learning something and if only I could kind of do it again. Um, Which part? I think there are things that I did imperfectly or like I said, I thought I knew certain things and I didn't. And I think that led me into rushing into things too fast and then having to be like, oh, I made a mistake. I was wrong here. And I feel kind of silly for having stated otherwise or something like that. Mm. I never expected that I... I never expected that I would be so passionate about being Circassian, about this. I mean, when I first started researching it, like, yes, it was important to me. And not that it's my whole personality or something like that, but um, something that I talk a lot about now and 
dedicate a lot of time to, like on social media, for example, um, and about trying to raise awareness. And it's always like shouting at a brick wall. I don't think that's quite the saying, but um, yeah, getting little engagement, stuff like that, and being really frustrated about it. I'm proud that I. I'm proud that I'm a Diga. Mm-hmm. I'm proud that I know. I will never choose ignorance and um and I'm I'm here and I, the fact that I <laughs> am Adiga, part Adiga can't be changed. And a bit in depth question. What is freedom? Ooh. Freedom uh I think freedom is being able to have a self determination in and sovereignty i think if if we if you don't have sovereignty then you're not truly free and i know i'm aiming this all towards like you know the caucuses and um but you know those are the things that are always on my mind and so if we don't have if we don't have things like sovereignty in our own sovereign nations um we don't have freedom and if only some of us have it in the caucuses but others don't then we still all don't have freedom if and we can apply that bigger if some people in the world don't have that sovereignty or are still still subjugated in certain ways and in many ways then none of us are free and my last question what is love um i think i will apply that to how circassian say i love you mm. um I'll try to say it. It involves one of the sounds that is hard to make and in like only you four other languages. It, you can say it a few <laughs> times and the one that sounds great okay. will keep. Uh, in Adigabza, we say, Sawafua um, which means I see you clearly. I see you well, um, which is apparently not literally in Circassian, but the translation in the movie Avatar, that's what it means. Mm-hmm. Um But um, I think in whatever type of love we're talking about, if that's romantic, if it's amongst friends and family, if it's amongst, um, you know, to something like a homeland, like nature, like a certain spot in your homeland or out in nature, um, there's an understanding. Mm. Um like an instantaneous understanding of each other. And I think that's a beautiful sentiment that I find again and again in our language of the literal translations and what they mean um, to see to see one another clearly, to see one another well. Like, I see you. I know you. I see what you are. I know what you are. I feel you. Um, that's beautiful. I think that's when you see something like that, that's love. Thank you. Can you explain what your tattoo means and the mm. shirt that you're wearing? Yeah, so I'm wearing, um, so there are 12 Circassian tribes. There are more. Some of them were completely wiped out in the genocides. I have seen other people still identify as them though. But I'm, so I'm Kabardian or Kabarde, um, and our land was called Kabarda. Um, so I'm wearing the um, seal of Kabarda. Um, Uh, which includes the arrows, um, which are on the Circassian flag, which I have tattooed right here. This mm. is my first tattoo I got. I got it on the anniversary that we commemorate the Circassian genocide. Mm. Um, the arrows signify um, peace. Um, when a, someone was traveling through the land, a Circassian was traveling through the land, they would have three arrows in their quiver. And mm. that was a symbol that they weren't there to fight. It was they were peacefully passing through. Um, And then my um, tattoo here is a Circassian dagger. And it has my family Tamga, which is like our family seals, uh, is right there. And then also in Arabic, it says Hajaret, um, which, so the, um, so I'm trying to like also say it fast. So the, so Russia was taking the east of Circassia first, was taking Kabarda. Um, my family n- knew and were fighting with Imam Shamil. Um, 
And when we lost, not my direct line, but a branch of the family uh, migrated with other Circassians to the west of Circassia to keep fighting. Mm -hmm. And they called themselves the Hajret Kabardians mm -hmm. um, as a way of like, um, um, like with the Hijras, with yeah. uh, Muhammad, with, right. the, right. with the migrations between Mecca right. and Medina, if I'm right. saying, remembering that That's correctly. Right. Yeah. Um, so it was, that was the word that they used as if they were going to continue to uh, resist and fight. So that's why I have this part as part of, you know, yeah. the resistance. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Or as, we say, as we say in Circassian, whoopso. Mm. How do you say that? Whoopso. Whoopso. Yeah. Kind of with like a W sound. Like whoop, ah, whoopso. Whoopso. Yeah. I learned something new. <laughs> oh, thank you. Whoopso. Thank you so much for watching today's video. I appreciate that. If you think it's worth sharing, please share, like it, and subscribe. It's free, it's quick, it's easy, and really helps the algorithm. By the way, if you're interested in sharing your story about how you came to United States from Russia or ex USSR countries, leave me a comment or send me an email at refugeefromrussiapodcast at gmail.com.